Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. Today's message is on consecration. It's the answer to the troubles plaguing humanity, the church, and every necessity of life. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold for things to be made of gold, and the silver for things of silver, the brass for the things of brass, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, uh, listerine stones and of diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold, of, orf, uh, of gold, the gold of Orpher, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house withal, the gold for the things of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Father, I pray now that your spirit would come in and anoint me and, and edify your people so that when they leave, they'll know that a man has spoken, but a God has declared. In Jesus' name, amen. Consecration. It's missing in the lives of most Christians today. I'm going to bring you a message, and I hope you can come to understand consecration. Now, David is looking for people who are willing to consecrate their service onto the Lord to build the house. And the first thing that you need to see and know is in any place of worship that man is going to build to go there and worship God, as David told the people of Israel as they're going to build the temple, the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. The ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not for man, but for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thereby in his crucifixion, in his consecration, in his sacrifice, man is redeemed to God's glory. David furthermore gives a heart of consecration. In verse 3 there he says, Moreover because I have set my affection to the house of my God. I have set my affection to the house of my God. David was a man of like passions as you and I. But God said that he was a man after his own heart. For even David in his weakness and his sins, which we see, he was a man that for most of his life, in most of his events, was consecrated unto the Lord his God. And God is looking for Christians to become consecrated. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Now, if we're going to talk about consecration, the first question is, what is consecration? What is consecration? Consecration is the act of separating from a common use to a sacred use, or of devoting and dedicating a person or thing to the service and worship of God. Consecration does not make a person or a thing holy but declares it to be sacred, that is, devoted to God or to divine service. And David asked the question, and who then is willing to consecrate his service 
this day unto the Lord. There are two parts that we need to be concerned with in understanding consecration. One, first, the person devotes themselves or something they have to the Lord and to his service. Over in Exodus, Moses made a call. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, <clears throat> even every man upon his son, upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. God will bless in the process of time those who consecrate themselves to him. Two, the Lord must accept that which is devoted and consecrated to him. In Micah, the scriptures speak, Arise and thrash, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. A person or a people must first be willing to consecrate themselves or something to the Lord, and then the Lord must be willing to accept it from them. God just doesn't accept anything. God was not willing to accept the offering of Israel when they came before him without the reverence and the love due his name. In fact, when the people of Israel wanted to offer their putrid worship to him, he flatly rejected it. A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? If I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon my altar. And ye say, Wherein have we polluted it, thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. You see, the people of Israel were God's people. And they were making a pretense of worshiping him and a pretense of a consecration to him. But they actually despised him. They didn't love him. They didn't honor him. They didn't reverence him. Their heart was not right with their God. They were not consecrated, though they were pretending to be so. They offered polluted bread upon the altar. And they said his table was contemptible. It's hard to imagine. But when God brought the people out of Egypt, and when they had no provisions, and they hungered, God, God rained upon them quail and, and manna, bread from heaven. It was a miraculous feeding that God fed his people for 40 years. And the Bible says, and man did eat angels' food. They ate supernatural food that angels consumed. And it would completely suffice them. And in the process of time, they began to despise it and find it contemptible. And God was sore displeased with them. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? Ananias and Sophia tried to do something like that. They hatched a scheme where they went out and sold, and they pretended they were giving it all to the Lord, but they're keeping some of it back. They, they were trying to make themselves look more dedicated, trying to make themselves look more spiritual than they really were. They were lying to the Holy Ghost, and God struck them dead. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? God's people weren't giving God the fruits of true love, giving God the best. They were giving God that which was no good, that which they couldn't use, and, and, and trying to make themselves look good. God says, offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? 
take a dead sick lamb up to uh, your governor and say, here you go, governor, here's some lamb chops for you. And see if he's going to be thrilled with it. He'll look at you like you're some kind of mad nut. I had it happen to me years ago. I've used, given you this illustration before. I'm just going to tell you, it just did not tickle my soul. I'm working for the uh, telephone company. I was making a pretty darn good income. And uh, this fellow was helping us work on the church. We were paying him. Uh, he decided to be a blessing to me. So he stopped at a bakery and got some free day-old bread that they took um, a uh, pencil and poked a hole in it so that it was identified as day-old bread. He brought it all up and threw it in my truck. And then he come over and like, you know, beaming and gleaming. And it's like, and, and folks, this is, this is 1980. This isn't uh, the dark ages, you know. I mean, this is 1980 with supermarkets and everything. Oh, I, I just gave you all this uh, day-old bread. <laughs> really? Well, I'm going to take your day-old bread that's stale and moldy. I mean, because by the time I got it, it was two days old. And I'm probably just going to toss it in the dumpster. I can afford to go buy it. Now, I could humble myself if I was starving to death. Then it would be maybe a blessing if you're starving to death. But uh, your God isn't starving to death. He created everything. He made everything. And he's really not interested in disingenuous service. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been by your means. Will he regard your person, saying, the Lord of hosts? All right, so now... They say, well, we want God to bless us, and we want God to honor us, and we want God to be gracious to us. I mean, what, you special? You a precious child? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle a fire on my altar for naught. God says, I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. So for consecration... You have to be willing to consecrate yourself, and then God has to be willing to accept it. Now, who can consecrate themselves to the Lord? Certainly not those that don't know him in his grace and mercy. Worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth requires a reverence from him and his sanctuary and the time of his fellowship. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things, and with all thy abominations, therefore will I diminish thee, neither shall my eye spare thee, neither will I have any pity. Your pastor, being consecrated to God, does not want to have contemporary Christian music in his church building because God would not accept it. We do not want an unacceptable offering to our God because our God does not want an unconsecrated offering. He will not accept it. There's a mentality as if, well, if I just give God something, God's obligated and God's going to bless me. No, that's not true. If you're going to consecrate to God, you have to give to God what God wants from you. God wants your heart. Tells you right in the book of Proverbs, Son, give me thy heart. Well, if God has your heart, he's going to get your first, first fruits in your best. My wife of 42 years has her husband's heart more now than she's ever had in her entire life. And because I love her, she gets the first fruits before I worry about taking care of myself. 
Before I get anything for myself, I make sure that everything I need for her is gotten. And God's looking for a heart to consecrate to him in the same manner. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, <clears throat> that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In order to consecrate oneself to God, you must know the Lord and his grace and his mercies. You must know the Lord as he is in his grace and his mercy. If you are a saved, born-again Christian, you have made yourself available of God's grace and mercy. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. If you know the Lord and his mercies, then you should know there is freedom from condemnation when we walk in his spirit. When a Christian walks in the spirit, there is no condemnation because of God's grace and mercy. All your sins are forgiven, your past sins, your present sins, your future sins. You are not, cannot, no, ever will be condemned. Because God has taken your condemnation. That's his grace and his mercy. We call this great mercy of God justification. Justification means to be declared righteous as a sinner puts on the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now printers picked up this term of justification in times past when they used to set type and make print and when they had everything set correctly and spaced correctly, they said they justified the print. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross and paid the penalty for your sins, he justified you. He made you just right in his sight so that you have no condemnation with God. So the Bible tells us, knowing that a man is not justified, by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, if you are saved by the mercy and the grace of God of the new birth, then you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit indwells our soul, then the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Godhead, lives in our souls. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So if the Holy Ghost lives in your soul, that's a, the third person of the Godhead is actually residing in you in your soul, then you are sanctified unto God. And sanctification means separation. It is a separation from the flesh, the world, and the devil, and unto God, and it brings us to adoption, which I'll say in a moment, but I want you to understand sanctification when the Holy Ghost comes into your soul. You see, your body is racked with sin, filled with sin, and is dying from sin. Wherefore, by one man, sin in the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The body's been lost, but God in salvation, supernaturally, when you repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, will cut away your soul from your flesh. And the Holy Ghost will come in and 
dwell in your soul. Because your soul will be cleansed by the blood of Christ. And your status will be justified by the word of God. And then the Holy Ghost will come into you to sanctify you. And your soul never touches your flesh again. And every Christian lives sinless in the state of their soul before God. All the sins that a Christian commits after his salvation are to his flesh. And they bring death quicker. But God gives eternal life and will cover that. So, when you are justified on the uh, sanctification, on to adoption, then we're uh, predestined to be conformed to his image. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That's one of the greatest passages of the scripture. In another place, it says, I will not fear what man should do unto me. Why? Because it doesn't matter what man does, what man says, he cannot change your acceptance in the beloved. God died for me. God saved me. And you too if you're saved. And God's in my soul. And it doesn't matter what men say. For God has spoken. In whom we have redemption through his blood. It's his blood that cleansed my soul and brought to me the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And I know him in his grace. Having predestinated on, unto us the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Over the last 34 years of pastoring, and the brethren, we get frisky from time to time. And I've had brethren say to me, you know, trying to scare me to get me to do something they want me to do. If you don't do what we tell you to do, God's going to kill you. <laughs> they don't know his grace. He died for me. He died for you. Listen to this. He died for you. He loved you. He's inside of you. He's indwelling you. Now, there's a fellow named Cain, wretched fellow. And Cain grew angry and hated his brother and, and beat his brains in and slew him and killed him. Cain violated the righteousness of God and deserved and earned for himself death and should have been destroyed and died immediately. But God in his mercy and grace marked Cain and gave Cain space and time to repent and be saved. Now when you have the brethren threatening you, scaring you, don't worry about what the brethren say to you. God's in you. God saved you. God loves you. God's justified you. Doesn't matter what man will do. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now we'll come to this a little bit further in the message, but we're talking about your predestination to be conformed to the image of his son. A lot of Christians today hold back their consecration and hold back on their being conformed to the image of his son. When you're born again, and you trust Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Ghost is living in your soul, God wants you to let his spirit conquer your flesh and rule it. He does not want you to let your flesh run away with itself. Your flesh is doomed. Your flesh is going to the grave, and it's going to be ashes. So don't be afraid to crucify it now. Because your, your flesh is a dead man walking. It's your soul and spirit that are going to heaven. And God, God in his goodness, God in his grace, God in his love is going to give you a new body, a glorified body that's not subject to the death of this world.
Which brings us to the next truth. God's grace and mercy is that we who are justified, sanctified, adopted, and predestinated are glorified. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Someday, you're going to be given a body, a glorious body, to replace this filthy, dying body, and it's going to be a body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, God is good. Yes, God's full of grace. Yes, God has great mercy. And if you really knew God, you'd know these things. And you might consider consecrating yourself. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he hath and bought it. Don't worry about what people think about you. Are you saved? Your God, your Savior, looks to you as a pearl of great price. He sold everything to buy you. What love, what grace, what mercy. Don't fear what man will do unto you. God's grace and mercy is that we who are justified, we who are sanctified, we who are adopted, we who are predestinated, are elected. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, election is the act of choosing. You might have been like me. And I had the blessing to be good in a couple sports. If they wanted to pick people for the wrestling team, I usually got picked quick. But boy, if we had a baseball team, I was usually the last one to be picked. And when I was a young kid, everybody was playing baseball, and I was always the last one to get picked. <laughs> I just wasn't a very good ball player. And you might have in your life found out that you just weren't number one popular person. You're the last one to get picked. Well, look at God's grace and God's mercy, because he picked you. You were chosen. You can't get saved if God doesn't want you. Yes, God said, whosoever will may. But God had to say that before you could get redeemed. And then his Holy Spirit came and knocked specifically on your heart door. And you weren't as foolish as many who keep their doors locked. But you opened it up. And you became a pearl of great price. Bought and paid for with the blood of a living God. Elective God. When we are justified, when we are sanctified, when we are adopted and predestined, we are elected to be a chosen vessel. Now he chose us for a purpose. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. God has chosen you to be a vessel to bear his name before the world, your friends, your relatives, your enemies. You should not fear what they say. You should not fear what they think. You are a chosen vessel. You have been chosen by God. You are a pearl of great price. Now, if you know the Lord, then you know how the Lord's grace and mercy redeems us, justifies us, sanctifies us, adopts us, so as to predestinate us to be glorified as a trophy of divine grace and mercy with eternal security. Romans says, as it is written, for thy sake... We are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There ain't nothing can get in the way between God's love for you once he's redeemed you. You are forever his. Blood bought, sanctified, separated, glorified, justified, adopted. When the Lord gives his people eternal life in his grace and mercy, then those redeemed, those justified, those sanctified, those adopted, those predestinated, those glorified trophies of divine grace and mercy receive the eternal security of God's eternal love. I like that song. What love, what wondrous love. And this is the record, right in the Bible, in writing, a contract signed in blood. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, if we're going to talk about consecration, you have to know God's love, and you have to know God's mercy, and you have to know God's grace. You have to be been born again. You must be born again. Now, if you are redeemed, born again, justified, sanctified, adopted, being predestinated to glorified trophies of divine grace and mercy with eternal security of the eternal love of God, promise you eternal life in him, then you should consider to consecrate your life to him who has so much grace and love and truth and righteousness for you. Now, if the Spirit of God would lead you to consecration of your life to Him, there's three things you need to know. The first thing you know, that consecration is voluntary. God will not make you consecrate yourself. No man, woman, child, or creature can cause you or make you to consecrate yourself to God. You have to give yourself to Him willingly. Speak on the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. If you want to offer yourself to God, if you want to consecrate yourself to God, you have to give yourself to God willingly. Many years ago, I made two of the greatest decisions in my life, and both of them were free will. Some 42 years ago, in free will, I pledged my soul and my being to my beloved wife. And she did in her free will to me, and today we still are bound together in the honor of that pledge. But even more important than that one, Some 38, 39 years ago, I came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the new birth. And within three years after that, I consecrated myself and I gave myself to the Lord for his service. It wasn't too long after that, he called me into the ministry. It's important you understand that every Christian should consecrate themselves to God, to his service. The odds are most Christians, God will expect them to serve in their local church for the rest of their lives. And from time to time, he'll call some out to take the gospel somewhere else. That's the way God works in his grace and mercy. But if you're going to consecrate yourself to God, you must give it willingly with your heart. 
God is looking for a people and a person who, is, who will willingly consecrate themselves to his service with a willing heart. Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring it an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. All offerings to God must be free will. The Bible says the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. The next thing you need to know about consecration, it's personal. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Consecration must be voluntary. Consecration must be personal. It must be your body, your vessel, your will, your heart. God will never make a soul do anything. He's simply looking for those souls that are willing to serve him. Service to the Lord is personal way of love bound in the cords of his grace and mercy and truth. In Leviticus it says, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Now a burnt sacrifice represents complete dedication, complete devotion. The burnt offering represents the Lord Jesus Christ's absolute submission to the Father. I'm going to do a study on the tabernacle pretty soon. If you were to study the tabernacle and we were to study the offerings, you study the burnt offering, it represents the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the offering is just totally consumed. So the Lord Jesus Christ is that burnt offering in Luke, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Complete burnt offering. The Bible said he made his soul to be an offering for sin. Consecration is personal faithfulness to Jesus Christ with your body, your soul, your spirit, under any and in every circumstance even to the death, if it need be. In the scriptures, there's a certain individual. If you want to know who he is, you can read Philippians. Right here, it doesn't tell you. And I'm not going to do that because I'm going to give you the liberty, the opportunity, and encourage you to consecrate yourself to God and let your name replace his name. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Christians sing Christian hymns all the time, and this is the reason that you need to see why you don't want to have contemporary church music. But you need to go by psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Our pianist was playing this song earlier. Listen to the words and learn of consecration. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and every power as you choose. Here am I, all of me. Take my life. It's all for thee. 
Take my will and make it thine. It shall, no, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet. Its treasure store, take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Consecration has to be voluntary. Consecration has to be personal. And consecration must be sacrificial. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Very few churches are concerned on keeping the house of God holy today. Notice it was to be a holy house. Over in 2 Samuel, David, and it's an interesting read if you read all of 2 Samuel 24, 24. Daniel, David, excuse me, David numbers the people of Israel, and there's several scholars and biblical studies try to find several reasons. Kind of mysterious of why David did what he did, but what he did was wrong. I can, you can find a few, you can find where he violated the law and you can find a couple other reasons. It has something to do with the heart. It has something to do with the pride of man and numbering the people. And uh, he, he was numbering the people below 20. He shouldn't have done that. He was supposed to uh, make an offering if he numbered the people. And uh, he was moved to do that sin. And he disobeys the Lord. And he numbers his army when he should not have done so. And the Lord judges him. But it says that, see, it, see, it says that the Lord was against Israel. See, Israel apparently had left its first love. And so David is moved to do this, and he does it. And then he gets, the, the, the judgment of the Lord comes, and he's given three options to choose. And he chooses wisely. He, he chooses to throw himself on the Lord in his grace and his mercy. And he asks not to fall in the hand of man. The Bible says that you do not want to put confidence in man. You don't want to trust man. You want to put all your confidence and trust in God. And so God tells him, okay, you've got to make an offering to me. You've got to make a sacrifice. And so David goes to buy the threshing floor of Arana. And the king said unto Arana, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings on the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. See, David was consecrated to God. He consecrated himself in his service for the house of God. And here's the future Temple Mount and the future worship of Israel throughout in the world and the nations throughout eternity. And David goes to buy that from this fella, and this fella is he's he's a servant of Jehovah, and he says, and he, he has respect to the king. He says, I give it to you. I give the whole thing to you. David says, No, no, no. I'm consecrated. I will offer to the Lord my God that which doth, I will not offer that which doth cost me nothing. Consecration is voluntary. Consecration is personal. Consecration must be sacrificial. God's looking for your consecration. Think about the song, how many times you sing it to music. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee.
And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? I'm asking you that are here today. Will you consecrate your service to the Lord? Forget about men and put God first in your heart. Would you follow your pastor in his consecration to God? You see, many men will proclaim their own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. I want to tell you, the Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, is wonderful. Listen, and he's good. But he doesn't make men do anything now. There's a day appointed for judgment. And I listened to a heart-rendering story last night. It just happened in the Middle East. In the Middle East, Christians are being slaughtered in a genocide. It's going to be awful to face God for those of us here who have just had some people say some bad things about them. Where in the Middle East, hundreds of thousands of Christians are being slaughtered. And this one individual had one of his members call him up and say, Today, ISIS came. And they said, You have to convert to Islam or we will kill you. And there was three little children. And they said, we love Jesus. And we've served Jesus all our life. And they put bullets in those kids' brains and left them dead for the mother and father to grieve. Undoubtedly, they will return in a day or two to kill the mothers and fathers. That's the wickedness and meanness and evil of man to inflict as much pain and hurt as possible. That's the baseness of his humanity. That's the spirit of hell in him. The Bible says of your Savior, he's holy, he's harmless, he's undefiled, and he's separate from sinners. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I, all of me. Take my life, it's all for thee. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet. It's treasure store. Take myself, and I will ever be only all for thee. That's the answer to world peace. That's the answer to restored families. That's the answer to every problem of humanity. Full consecration. What is consecration? The act of separating from a common use in the world to sacred use of devoting and dedicating a person or thing to the service and worship of God. Part one is the person devotes themselves. Part two, God has to accept it. And as born again Christians, you have been accepted. Consecration is voluntary. Consecration is personal. And uh, consecration is sacrificial. What page, brother? 